Hi, this is Dr. Robert Myers. I'm with the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. Thanks for joining for another session of Soap School, where we're talking about uh, artificial healthcare, artificial intelligence, uh, entrepreneurship. I think this is our sixth uh, session. So if you haven't seen the other ones, go to the YouTube channel, which is Soap Video uh, on YouTube, and you can uh, uh, download the other sessions. So I'm pleased uh, to welcome uh, our colleague and friend, uh, Ben Babu in New York. Ben, hi. And um, uh, he's going to talk about uh, healthcare AI applications, and then we can get into a conversation about uh, some various aspects of this. So, uh, Ben, thanks a lot. Uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Harlan. Appreciate it. Nice to be here. And a little bit about myself. I'm a hospital medicine physician for about 20 years working in the academic environment. I'm an assistant professor at the New York College of Medicine in Valhalla, New York, and we're currently undergoing an elective with regards to digital health, AI applications, and entrepreneurship for the fourth year students as well, and, <clears throat> and our resident teams here within academia and hospital medicine are developing research projects within this realm. So I'm going to be talking about healthcare applications, current state, and the emerging applications. I have no disclosures, and this is more of an interactive session, so if you find an interesting piece that you can talk about, it's we can discuss further. The summary are the essential issues, the inefficiencies within healthcare, and provide AI solutions for them. We'll review the AI market at its current state and the prototype development pipeline towards implementation the regulatory framework, the current state of AI, and emerging applications. People who are in the healthcare field are faced with enormous burden, administrative burden, within the healthcare, uh, within <clears throat> EMR systems that take away from patient care, and it's more directed towards billing purposes. And this gives you an overview of how much time we allocate towards EMR billing and FaceTime with the EHR instead of patient care. And most of the times right now, this burden is carried during our personal time after work hours, trying to meet the current standards for insurance purposes, billing and coding. It creates physician burnout, as most of the healthcare providers know, with cognitive load, fatigue, with the all these manual data entry tasks that can be automated and improve operative efficiency within the hospital systems. The current market now, as of the Grandview research, shows that there's a progressive growth with about almost 40% over a period of eight years and continues to grow. This is the, a new slide that shows the current FDA and how much they've approved these regulatory devices, which are approximately over 700 now within all realms of medicine. This was released a few weeks ago. And then this is the clinical applications now that FDA approved devices have released. The regulatory framework is now evolving and becoming more mature uh, in alignment with the uh, the growth of this AI technology. AI, United States have developed an AI bill for rights, and that's a work in progress, as well as the AI EU Act as well. They're planning on implementing the first policies this year and then having just having companies be in compliance within the next year or two. President Biden had released a new safety institute consortium to help with the oversight you know, from the United States perspective on the safety of these AI applications. And this was in February 8th of this year. As well and so as... can I uh, can I can I ask you a question just as we're going through this? Um, 
So this issue of AI regulation, ethics, responsible use, et cetera, et cetera, is getting a lot of attention. Um, yesterday, there was an announcement that the Congress is, is going to sort of get their arm, try to establish some regulations or guidelines. My question really is, um, it, what is your take on whether these folks are really going to be able to do this? I mean, the, the polls indicate that doctors, patients, and healthcare executives don't trust Congress, the government, or industry to regulate artificial intelligence in healthcare. What, what do you think? Well, this consortium is made up of academic institutions from the healthcare perspective, and that would hopefully, hopefully provide some level of trust from the healthcare provider side of things. And this consortium consists of a blend of, of a list of, they have, if you go onto their website, they have a list of all of, of the academic systems that are involved, such as the Chai group and other academia, in addition to the industry. And therefore, hopefully that'll ease that trust issue. And, and what's going on and I'll just ask this to the group. What, what's going on at your institution as far as responsible AI? Is, is there, for example, a, uh, uh, an ethics, an AI ethics committee or something like that? Or are we just sort of winging it at this point? Ruth? Hey, Arlen. Um... You know, I think, well, just your first question, I think government plays a role, but I it can't be the only it can't be the only source of of responsibility and truth. Uh, I think home institutions need a a large part. I think um, companies, private companies need to have uh, a hand in it as well. that That's ideal state. And what's happening where I'm at is, um I think it's slow, but there is a we're calling it a governance AI committee, but it's but it's really what you described, Marlon, more of a kind of uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary responsible AI group. Um, I think the hard part is to try and make this group um, sort of guideline principle-based and not necessarily project ownership-based, meaning another source of, um, you know, uh, priorities and 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 money. Uh, whereas, whereas sort of main groups, departments, service lines um, should still drive that. But um, the approach is twofold, uh, a safety group and an education group. Yeah, I think there's some other layers that we're all encountering. Not all, but those are all of this. I mean, one is uh, the IRB. So if, if and that's a whole nother conversation about navigating IRBs when you're dealing with AI products. And I don't know whether anyone has that experience with that and they want to relate us in this group, but um, that just sort of introduces another wrinkle in, in, in another hoop in, in terms of patient protection. And could you, yeah, if, if you're not, yeah, thanks for muting. Um, so one is, the IRB. The second has to do with what we're talking about, which is the ethics committee. Now, most hospitals have an ethics committee, but the ethics committee is not an AI ethics committee. And then the question becomes, well, should it be? And is it a subcommittee of the committee? And what, in fact, does the ethics committee do? And what if you violate the ethics committee, who's accountable, and then what happens? Um, and these are all unanswered questions that I think we're going to have to figure out sooner than later. And the third is conflict of interest. So, you know, you're in a, and most IRB committees now, or ethics committees, have a conflict of interest subcommittee that basically looks at is Arlen Myers the owner of AI, of whatever dot AI trying to introduce that product into the University of Colorado? 
And is that a conflict of interest? And the answer is, yeah. But we all have conflicts of interest. So how, how do you manage the conflict of interest other than, I mean, you can't eliminate it. You have to mitigate or manage it. So how do you do that? And I've been on both sides of the table because I've been on a COI committee of the IRB. And this was this very question, like, how do you do due diligence? Is this something that's trivial? I mean, is there a major financial interest in the company? Are you just sort of a subject matter expert, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some issues that I think you're gonna have to, uh, to run into. Uh, Sri, do you wanna make a comment? Yeah, the only thing I want to add, Arlen, is uh, typically if you look at uh, clinical research committees and IRBs, it's usually someone who's an ethicist or what you'd call as a bioethicist. Yeah. But what I would think, particularly from an AI standpoint, is the regular ethicist or bioethicist would not be good enough for this because it would have to be someone with a very good understanding of what AI can do and cannot do. So I visualize actually a specialized role of someone who's an right. AI ethicist that would not necessarily come un come under the ambit of what we, we would previously call as um, um, ethics or bioethics. This would be something um, highly specialized, someone who can transcend um, both AI and ethics so is what I uh, right. think of it as. And more and more we're seeing the emergence of AI bioethicists. So that brings up the issue of, uh, and I think what we're gonna see is like training programs, master's degrees in AI bioethics. Exactly. And and finally, and, and I just had this comment with Ben just prior that why does every place need to have their own ethics committee? So I think this is an opportunity for people like, to be virtual bio AI bioethicists and have a virtual platform where if somebody wants to present a case, you have all these people like, you know, that are all over the world that can put their two cents in, make a recommendation, that kind of thing. I would imagine at some point you'd have to some patient health information or something you'd have to figure out. But I mean, you could disguise the case and say, you know, here's the case for the day. XYZ wants to do whatever and here are the issues and what do you think and what are our recommendations? So I think more and more, and I think there's an opportunity for people that want to get involved in this as a non-clinical gig to essentially be a virtual AI bioethicist consultant to buy AI bioethics committees at hospitals. So I think there's all kinds of opportunities with this thing and I just think it's going to continue to uh, my concern is, you know, already there's seven government agencies, including the VA, the FTC, the SEC, the White House, the Congress, and you know what that looks like. So I just don't think you have all these people. Again, why doesn't the government have one shot to figure this out and just get everybody around? Because it's politics and it's the government and it's, uh, you know, turf and all that other stuff. So I... No, well, thank goodness we're going in one direction, but I think it's going to take a while. Three. So what you are looking at, Arlen, is like a centralized virtual dashboard of sorts where you can go and present your right. ethical situation and people will give you feedback. Right. And I would take it even a step further. So how about chat GPT for AI bioethics? So it's a small language model that specifically deals with AI bioethical issues. And you don't even need, you could just, you know, enter it into the box and it'll give you sort of the headlines and the list of stuff. And then you distribute it to people on the committee and say, hey, read this stuff because we're going to come and discuss it. It's kind of like a flipped committee. And we're going to give you all this stuff. And then you come up with your genius and let us know what you think and give us your recommendations as far as this case is concerned. And, so and who, it, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. And who, in your yeah. opinion, would be sitting on those committees? Well, my suggestion is, again, uh, the, the committees have, have become complicated because of many issues, not the least of which is NIH requirements, that if you are proposing something to an IRB that's going to get NIH funding, you've got to jump through a bunch of hoops not the least of which is 
ethics and conflict of interest. Now we're adding AI conflict of interest. So uh, the people that need to be, as you've pointed out in this group, have to be the, the usual suspects in IRB and, and in grants, but also AI domain experts, do, de, uh, digital people, uh, data scientists, bio, AI bioethicists, et cetera, et cetera, and patients. So it's that group has to sort of figure this out. So in some sense, then I would actually branch all of this and say, Emerging technologies ethicist, because we're going to soon have metaverse, we're going to have blockchain, we're going to have AI. And then in that emerging technologies, the emerging technologies ethics, whatever board, you have people with expertise in AI, blockchain, metaverse, VR, right. AR, because all right. of those are going to be part of healthcare anyway. Coming right. So you have a matrixed AI bioethics platform and you just enter the, the case and it tells you who should be on, in the consultation and you charge for it. I mean, why should you do this for free? You set it up as a business and, you know, and people dedicate their time or donate an hour. I'm going to charge you 250 bucks to sit on your virtual AI bioethics committee meeting and give you my two cents. Anyway, that's where I think we're, you know. Anyway, so let's move on, uh, Ben. Okay, and then. In addition to the above governing bodies, we discussed also the AMA has a similar framework. During AI prototyping and development, always want to look at the use case from both clinical perspective as well as business use case, the strategies on how you're going to implement and use the, the data, hardware, and from an operative side of things and teams, how, what's your IP, and the overall how it's going to improve both provider and, and patient outcomes as well as the regulatory legal framework and governance and safety. There are AI risks that most of the people on this panel know, automation, algorithmic, inclusion, fairness, bias risks, generalizability, a lack of explainability and trust, along with being transparent, unintended outcomes. During production, you have data drift and shifts that need to be adjusted for and adversarial attacks. Can you just go back one slide, uh, just so people understand, maybe, could you define the drift? What do you mean by drift? <clears throat> drift basically means that any incoming data, and there's d different types of drift, any incoming data can change over time that can affect the model's output. And that needs to be, that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. There's different types of drift. The drifts can actually occur within the data itself, healthcare data. It can happen within the model uh, at the different levels of model during the different levels of model development during the feature, the features that are used for model development. And it all could be also have aspects within the inference time and outputs. So along the whole spectrum, we have to manage the drift. And if you don't, the the results may be uh, not accurate. So there have been several examples of this recently in some journals, which basically says predictive analytics using AI is not reliable for that very reason. And so do you agree with that? Yes, for the most part. And I think you have big academic systems that have their teams in place and infrastructure. And I think that from an operation side of things, length of stay and billing on the back end, those operations are uh, more 
uh, more advanced and less regulated. But from a clinical decision side of things, yes, there are difficulty because of a whole variety of reasons. And and by adversarial attacks, you mean like deep fakes and hacking? Hacking, and I'll give you an example. For uh, bad actors and systems, they, they add noise that can create a false output or inaccurate output or an output that is undesirable. Um, and this gets to the issue, you mentioned blockchain. Um, and this is sort of getting more and more attention and one at possible uh, use of blockchain is to manage this data stream and prevent the kinds of things that you're talking about. You're not, you're not, you, are you incorporating any of that into what you guys are doing or no? No, not yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. If you're interested, just by the way, if you're interested in blockchain and life science, there's, there's a book called Blockchain in Life Science, which is a Springer book that is edited by a friend of mine, Wendy Charles. It's a pretty good overview of the future or the present of blockchain, particularly as it relates to drug discovery and development and clinical trials and these kinds of issues. So. Go ahead. Okay. And there's, during development, there are goals and best practices to follow. We're able to provide accurate physiologic outputs that reduce cognitive load in a autonomous way, ideally, with transparency and a governance framework without bias. And then Microsoft has been in this field for a while and they have their standards, which most of the regulatory bodies now are adapting towards that we discussed, accountability, transparency, inclusion. Can you go back to the previous slide? Um, yeah, maybe go back to the one before that. So we've talked about uh, the the risks, and my question is, what are the what have been the quantifiable benefits of the application of artificial intelligence in clinical practice? There's basically three areas where it's been used most often, or two, and maybe three you can address this. One is operations to finances and then of course there's clinical and in the clinical area most of the applications have been in radiology but the question is so what what has been the return on investment of the application of ai in those areas and the most recent survey in asking that question to healthcare executives was essentially zero like they didn't see any return, financial return on investment, spending lots of time and money incorporating healthcare artificial intelligence into their platform. That said, the, the majority were optimistic that sometime in the future, the bet would pay off. But as of now, most folks aren't using it a whole heck of a lot and they're not realizing a financial return on investment, which most of us understand is sort of the bottom line. Literally, the bottom line is the bottom line. So Sri, what's your take on that from the radiology community? I, I totally agree with you, Arlen. We are still at the stage where we have to see tangible benefits from all of this, because one of the things with this at the front end is that there's a lot of training that's required for incorporation of AI and deployment, both in terms of equipment, personnel, software, blah, 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 all of those things. That is one. On the radiology side of things too, you'll actually see that funnily enough, it's still all the administrative aspects that are having some benefit, like scheduling, for example, optimizing scan protocols, um, uh, helping radiologists with the interpretation of the whatever you see on the scan. But from purely a clinical standpoint, it's still a work in progress. Of course, um, with uh, radiology, 
and the incorporation of pathology and genetic information and the idea of creating a composite image that has all of it. In the future, yes, the radiologist is going to be the chief uh, uh, informatician, so to speak, with access to pathology, genetic information, and imaging, all of it creating a composite thing that the radiologist potentially could interpret. But we're still some time away from seeing all of that. And, and totally agree with the that the tangible benefits will probably accrue uh, from, especially from a financial standpoint, sometime in the future, but we are not there yet. So if we were to attend the Radiologic Society of North America, uh, what, what, because every week it seems like people are having this conversation about radiology education, training, is it going to limit my job? Do I want to pick that residency? How's it affecting me on the ground? It, so is what we're saying sort of the current understanding or, or are you hearing something different? It's all very inhomogeneous, so to speak. Uh, there's, there's people who completely have bought in and there's still others who are, who are skeptical. I would say uh, we don't have one clear path going forward is my feeling. It's still, um, some people still don't uh, get it and there are others who are far ahead of the curve. Yeah. Um, who, who think that uh, um, um, AI, particularly from a radiology standpoint, could do a lot. But yeah. it's there is no one composite view that I see from. So, if your next if your next door neighbor has a son who's a graduating medical student about to pick a residency, and he says or she says, "I think I want to be a radiologist," what would you tell him? Oh, that's a great question because I had exactly that same call from a classmate <laughs> in Abu Dhabi whose daughter joined radiology and then I had been out of touch with this guy for about 20, 30 years and suddenly every morning he says, Sri, I need to talk to you urgently. I need to talk to you urgently. So I thought he was looking to me for some scan interpretation or whatever. But then he says, my daughter joined radiology and everybody here is saying she's made a colossal mistake um, um, and um, what do you think? So I said the only uh, person who's actually going to be left behind is the one who's a radiologist and doesn't know how to use AI in his or her work. That's the way I look at it right now. We're currently in a bit of a hype cycle, especially um, overall in terms of what AI can do in healthcare and particularly in radiology. Some of it will will uh, coalesce around a more balanced and a more nuanced view uh, in the upcoming years. But I definitely see, at least from a radiology standpoint, and especially because the next best specialty that's impacted uh, significantly is pathology. Uh, there's some value in, in, in uh, analyzing huge amounts of genetic data. And when you put all of those three together, uh, then definitely uh, someone who's in radiology and who has an understanding of AI and how AI can uh, work with uh, imaging data sets and all of these other specialities, yeah. that person's going to be in a pole position. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I don't think this is going to, I mean, it's going to affect every specialty, but particularly the pattern recognition specialties, you know, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, radiology, derm, path, things you mentioned, radio. And I don't think it's going to happen until the RRC, the Residency Review Committees, uh, make it a competency and basically hold you accountable for teaching it during the residency. If you don't, they ding you. Um, likewise, the ACGME has a role in all of this um, and board exams have a role in all of this. So I just think, to put it bluntly, unless it's on the test, people aren't going to, you know, they'll do it, but there'd be more an incentive to speed it up if it were on the test. Would you agree with that? Yes, Alan. I think part of the responsibility lies with us too, in the sense that we need, for those who, who are not there yet, it's our responsibility to bring them up to speed yeah. and, 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 and potentially to show them what it is that this uh, tool can do. Granted, the tool has some issues that need to be addressed, 
but a part of the responsibility or i'd say rather a large part of the responsibility lies on us to bring others up to speed in terms of how all of this can impact healthcare in general and some of these pattern recognition specialities in particular so the onus mm -hmm. on dissemination of ai education and also bringing people up to speed fundamentally lies uh, with all of us who are involved with ai in some sort of way and and getting people up to speed in terms of what this tool can potentially do granted there are some fixes that need to happen but it's in our it's in our basket so to speak right okay let's move on then okay in order to gauge bias there are various I mean, tools that are that are being developed and it's an active area of research in order to gauge bias, understand it metrically, and how to implement a solution for it. There, every time bias, it, when you're dealing with this and methods to create solutions around it, there's always, there can be performance uh, reduction risks. So the accuracy has to be kept in mind on how the model performs when adjusting for these biases, especially when dealing with pre-training models. So, solution bias, fairness, inclusion. Is it no? This gets fairly technical. The regulatory bodies that we all know about, uh, <laughs> FDA, and I'm not going to go through all of this right now, but FDA, F the 510K, and the Novo Pathways <clears throat> exist. Most most of the innovations are 510K and an equivalent that's in the market that's being approved. And then software is a medical device on safety when developing these product commercially based on clinical risk one through three. It sounds it, right? Then I had a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, it's one of the issues with uh, bias is in, in trying to fix it, what uh, guardrails do we have to prevent overcorrection? Now going on the other side. That's a great question, Sri. I actually don't know. It gets fairly technical in terms of what bias mechanisms are available, biases during pre-training, the data biases within the model itself, and there's a list, and there's a, a, a an article that was by a group looking at all the different mechanisms on how to control for bias, and it's located within the archive system, and it lists everything. But in order for overcorrection, that's an area of active research that I I can't answer right now. But that's definitely something that has to be considered, and how to gauge for it. Uh, like one the of the issues, side of things. You know, to that point, one of the uh, issues that people are trying to address has to do with the incidence and prevalence of a given disease and predictive analytics. So if you're trying to use this to identify a rare disease, you're going to get a lot of false positive, like false positives. And so they're trying to figure, they're, they're trying to integrate, you know, the ROC, the, the, the uh, receiver operating curve is sort of the standard of trying to figure this, this out, whether it's positive or negative predictive value and all the other metrics. But now there seems to be a lot more interest in incorporating those standards of disease prevalence and incidence to avoid what you're describing, to over predict in a relatively small patient population who had the disease, like an orphan disease. So that's about all I know about it because obviously I'm not in the weeds, but that is a question that people more and more are beginning to ask. Yeah, and that could be a case by case basis. For example, imbalanced data. It's a it's a very big and active area of research. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the ISO IEC have already an existing framework for software. However, they developed um, a new standard for AI systems for businesses now, which is 42001. And it provides the businesses to become compliant with ISO IEC standards if they're using AI. And most of the big tech companies are applying for this certification. And it's equivalent to JCO hospital certifications meeting a certain quality benchmark. Um, I would just mention that I put something in the chat about uh, standards. Um, there, there are two, this is another layer of things that you sort of have to consider. And this has to do with technical standards versus management standards. And the whole world of standards is very complicated. But when you, so these are technical standards, like when you're create, like NIST, like when you're creating something, does, do you meet the technical standard? Um, but then there's another side of this, which is the healthcare management standard. It's, a, it's almost like the JCAHO or any other sort of accreditation organization. You have a list of standards on how what you should be doing as a standard when it comes to X. And in this particular case, using artificial intelligence in your, in your uh, uh, information system. But what are the best, what are the standards as it applies, and it turns out that there's something called the Health Standards Institute, which is a representative of the American National Standards Institute, which is ANSI, A-N-S-I, which participates in the International Standards Inst Organization, which is ISO. So when you start getting into this, again, it's a ne another level of complexity, but if you are in a position at a healthcare facility where you're the claim, you're the champion, or you're trying to get this done or integrated or whatever, it's another thing that you sort of have to deal with. And I don't think most people think that far. I mean, they understand sort of, well, you need to get the FDA to approve it or clear it or whatever word you want to use. But then there's the standard. Now, the standard compliance is in most instances optional but more and more people are adopting the standard as the good housekeeping seal not just for quality purposes but for marketing purposes and competitive advantage as well so i just bring that up that if you're not if you're not certain if that's not on your radar screen uh, you, you might want to start snooping around and looking at it and i put the link on the on the chat it'll give you some idea of what and, and i'm on the board of this thing that's why I know about some of this stuff. It's not a promotion. It's I'm not trying to get you selling anything. I'm just saying it's a link to, to, to create awareness of what's going on. Okay. All right, we're gonna talk about quickly the current applications of AI. The, we have the autonomous diabetic retinopathy system that's geared towards primary care physicians and low resource environments, which were able to detect diabetic retinopathy without the need for specialists. And this has been out since 2017. Stroke, large vessel occlusion has been AI detection systems and triaging, as well as notification of the interventional teams have been out since 2017 by various groups and now have been implemented and now have been approved by FDA for the uh, intracranial hemorrhage protocols with volume assessments, how much the bleeding is and if they're subdural. So our medical school teams and resident teams have developed a systematic review on the clinical impact of large vessel occlusions and AI applications, and it's shown that it improves triage times, patient processing times from the time the AI detects it, large vessel occlusion on strokes, to the time they have intervention. And the time to intervention time has improved. 
However, our analysis to date shows that there's we're not able to assess the clinical impact based on the current literature, as well as the costs, because it's just too early. So just to use this as a use case, so somebody has signs or symptoms of a stroke and they call 911 and the ambulance shows up at the front door. Um, so walk us through how this works. So is the system in the ambulance in the field or how does this actually work? Uh, that's a great question. There are systems that are outside of the healthcare space and we didn't, this particular study did not focus on that. This this study focuses on the acute stroke pathway when the patient comes in, hits the door, gets the CAT scan. The CAT mm -hmm. scan is being read by the AI system, deep learning mm -hmm. CNN model. And then that gets alerted, that information gets alerted to the interventional radiologists, the radiologist, and the other care teams to coordinate the care to get to time to door to time to intervention. That door to intervention, door to puncture, and door to outcome times are shortened, and it shows improved operative efficiency when using AI systems than when using not AI systems, when patients that are systems that are not using AI. So there is some significant improvement. And it's just too early to see the clinical impact, but there are some studies leaning towards a better better outcome. But we want to see more robust clinical trials to, to, to hang our hat on from a clinical perspective, as well as who, the cost perspective comes down the road. And who pays for this, and how do you bill for it? Right now, the there is reimbursement for the large vessel occlusion, as well as adoption of the these newer technologies through a program called NTAP, and it's time dependent. Usually, I think it's about two years, you get paid a certain amount to help with the cost during this new innovation. And there's a certain CPT code or or something that, you know, code, a technical yes. code that you, you use in the system? That's correct. Hmm. Okay. Cardiology is, the field is now uh, being adopted, the AI applications are being adopted within the cardiology realm, uh, particularly the FFR CT right now. This is a CAT scan of the heart looking at the vessels and with a three dimensional reconstruction showing what AI forecasts the, the obstruction within the coronary arteries without the need for uh, coronary artery catheterization. And if what's called, if there's a low if there's a low flow occlusion, less than 0 .8, 0 0.80, those patients are referred for cardiac catheterization. Now the workflows are pretty interesting here. The hospital system, they send the, the, the CAT scans from the heart to, to this heart flow company through our, a secure server. And their heart flow team, their data tech team, analyze it and creates a computational fluid dynamic flows of the heart and using AI and gets a, an estimate on what the occlusion and the degree of occlusion is, sends that information back to the primary hospital. So that's how the workflow in the developers that are out there are probably interested in how to implement this in clinical How long practice. does it take? Without... How long does it take to get the result? That's a good question. I actually don't know them, and I'm I can't even hedge. But I think that it shouldn't take that long. Interesting. And then now this CTFFR FFR CT is now being incorporated into the clinical guidelines. In conjunction with Mayo Clinic, they have Anuma and Mana. That's an AI tech company, as well as Inference. Together, have developed a algorithm that detects low ejection fraction by using EKGs. And now they're undergoing clinical trial with re with regards to this, a bigger clinical trial. But this nature medicine article that I'm showing you was about a few years ago, their initial results. 
and which is pretty interesting that this can be deployed out to primary care physicians and low resource environments looking at just primary EKG to see who has a low EF because then you can optimize their heart failure regimen and prevent them from getting worse, getting readmitted to the hospital or getting admitted to the hospital or managing it in the in the first steps of heart failure management. Yeah. You, um, actually, there's a lot of stuff coming out on like an EKG these days is sort of like the new fingerprint. I mean, you can tell an awful lot of stuff about someone's everything just from their EKG. And more and more, we see these papers coming out that you could tell, are they male? Are they female? You know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Their kidney function, God knows what, just based on their EKG. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'd be uh, interested to see what how it evolves out. Same, similarly, there's um, evidence showing that ML applications that are used in clinical realm, this study shows who's diuretic responsive and who's not, and how to tailor precisely the diuretic dose based on their responsiveness using ML applications. This is a heart failure group from Texas in a recent study. What is a phenomap? Phenotypic map uses the clinical parameters, and then they feed that into the ML system, machine learning system, and then that'll be able to forecast who is diuretic res receptive, who is responsive to diuretics, who's not. And based on that, that will help guide the diuretic treatment strategy. And then furthermore, along the realms of cardiology, but from a pediatric domain, the AI is able to better detect or able to detect rheumatic heart failure by way of <clears throat> an analyzing the mitral regurgitation in comparison to the cardiologist. And it, and it did well in comparison to the cardiologist. So you'll see a lot of these echocardiograms being automated towards EF, I mean, for example, EF and assessments of disease-specific states, such as rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatic heart disease from an early stage. And that was that is what this specific study did, and they had pretty good uh, accuracy and results, performance results. So now that we're seeing, now that we're seeing the AI hammer applied to every conceivable nail, how do we decide, because these things are like exploding every day in every specialty. So how do we know which one to use when? How, how will that work? Yeah, this as Cambrian type of explosion, this technology, it's very hard to figure out and keep a pulse on it. But over time, I think most of these systems will be integrated these on one platform. And so that's so that would you know, alleviate that problem. For example, most commercial platforms are developing one one size all solution instead of buying individual algorithms. And you'll see uh, uh, that platform orchestrate all these algorithms together once they all get approved down the road. So you don't have to worry about that. Well, I think. If artificial, I mean, I think if these products were and are uh, created and regulated as medical devices, then for any specific intervention or any specific symptom, disease, prediction, whatever, it's just like you see a patient with uh, depression. And my understanding is there's something like 50 something drugs to treat depression. So how do you know which one to use for the particular patient that's staring you in the face, or in this case, on the screen? And if it doesn't work, then what do you do? So there, there, and then there are these platforms inside of the electronic medical record that say, he, for, for what you have told me this patient has, here's the cost-effective analysis of how this, which drug this patient is most, most likely to respond to, and more importantly, pay for it. So if you give me a drug that costs, uh, it, in some cases, $3 million in gene therapy, 
and what's the cost benefit of prescribing that? Well, I can't afford that. Then what else do you use? And what's the trade-off? So again, I think the opportunity for all of this is, is a platform that is embedded into the electronic medical record that says, um, this person has, a, you know, that we think this person had a stroke, like you just said. And here are 15 different AI tools to deal with this person and what we think they have. And it would, it would help you like a clinical decision support system to choose which, which tool to use. I'm not saying which intervention, I'm saying which tool. So it's like, which drug do you pick for the depression? Which algorithm and which product do you pick for the depression to help you understand which drug to pick? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, Adlin, because the other thing that can happen, especially if you incorporate uh, AI with uh, Internet of Things and Internet of Medical Things, for example, where yeah. you can have uh, cloud computing and uh, patient uh, remote monitoring, for example, right. uh, it's possible to predict what sequence, what drug should be used, what particular sequence should be used, when right. you should amp the dosage of the drug, at uh -huh. what point the patient's likely to get better. And then for, because they have access to real-time information, also on the fly, make any necessary changes in the route of administration, dosage of administration, nature of drug, whether it's a single drug or a cocktail and so on. All of that is potentially possible in the future. Yeah. And for those of you who don't, for those of you who don't know, the New England Journal of Medicine has recently launched AI in medicine, and every uh, every once in a while they produce another article. It, actually, this week it's produced on Tuesday, but it's disseminated on Thursday. This week, the article is uh, art, uh, digital health uh, use in uh, remote digital health in epilepsy. And it's a pretty comprehensive article about, you know, how people are using remote sensing and digital health in the world of epileptology. And every week or every other week, they have another application. So it's a really good resource and reference to kind of get you up to speed about what we're talking about here. Now, you know, the impact and all that other stuff is another question, but if you're not familiar with, you know, where do I go to learn about this stuff? And I don't have a million hours to learn about it. You know, the New England Journal is a pretty good resource, so I'd recommend that. Yeah, uh, Sri, that's an excellent comment because we're going to be discussing digital twins and virtual applications, dose precision, dose deployment, the drug development. But that, that's that's uh, active area of research. Yeah, we have six more minutes. Okay. Kaiser Permanente has released their data on how people are using uh, ambient intelligent solutions for the the patient to doctor uh, interaction and they've shown that using these ambient solutions how it goes is these solutions are being implemented within the during the discussion of the patient uh, the doctor patient relationship it gets recorded and then placed into a template wow. and in, a, in that format gives you the time to talk to patients and have that quality interaction without the need for using electronic medical records, which take away from the, the quality interaction. And patients have the outcomes for this, it reduces the clinical burden, uh, the, the administrative burden that is on manual typing. The quality, it, it, their results show that it has preservation within the notes from a quality perspective. And also there, the people, the patients had a, a positive outcome. They, they liked the fact that the provider was able to discuss the clinical care without the need for typing and taking their attention away from the patients. This is a pilot, a regional pilot from TPMG and it's within New England Journal released about a few weeks ago. So it's essentially a cheaper, better, faster, smarter dictation system. Yeah. 
essentially yeah. reduces pajama time and time out right. of you know right. personal personal right. time. And those of us who are old enough remember when actually we used to just pick up the phone and dictate a note. <laughs> so this is the sort of same same sort of thing. Obviously, fast forward forty years, it's a lot different. But yeah, it, it actually will. I mean, I you know, art of scribes are sort of a band aid until something better comes along to eliminate them. So I think a whole lot of scribe companies are going to get disintermediated and go out of business. And this is how their one of their radar plots on the metrics that they use to gauge the quality of this tool. Emerging technologies for the little bit amount of time that we have. Large language models have created a big buzz hype and are in the active stage of development towards the towards medicine. There are ways to adapt the, these models for domain specific applications such as medicine and for example using rag rag based framework what that does is it takes medical data transforms it into a vector format a mathematical representation of how these llms can see and incorporate that and they have a retrieval mechanism in place on how to retrieve the data. And the Stanford group is creating a medical co-pilot similar to like the up-to-date version and the up-to-date application, but using generative AI. It's in the stages of development and this model is being tested against Stanford's expert medical okay. providers. And the next iteration of this are small language models. So large there's language models. Yeah. That's correct. There's there's a trend towards either optimizing a large language model and implementing it or optimizing a small language model to the best capability with medical information. So right now, the from what I'm hearing, the current bigger models such as ChatGPT have already been trained on some level of medical data prior to. And when they compare the open source smaller models, they're underperforming. But there's ways around that on how to adapt these models in, in clinical medicine. So just so people know, what does RAG stand for? It stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. And this is a study on how the response of using ChatGPT in the public forum as question and answers to patients. And they, the question and answer format, they preferred the question and answer from ChatGPT and over the provider. It gave more an elaborate response and it gave them a perception of more empathy. So we're running out of time. Um, so I wonder if we could just sort of summarize this, Ben, and uh, what 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 should be the take home of what you just said? I mean, you're teaching residents, you're talking to students, you're getting your hands dirty doing this stuff. What's the bottom line? The bottom line is that we're undergoing a transformation within this AI space and this will give you an idea of what the current market is and how to to give you an understanding of how to use this applications in medicine as it continuously evolves and be able to stay on stay abreast on how this to, this technology develops over time and as this technology advances we'll see more clinical validity and applications as probably within the next 5 10 20 years and hopefully to ease the the administrative burden and improve operations and clinical outcomes. Good. Well, thanks very much for all this uh, interesting information. I hope everybody had a uh, enjoyed the conversation. Our next uh, session, we'll have two more sessions. The next one is in March. So 
stay tuned and uh, we'll hope to see you then. And uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. Bye.